different address, but I'll just write down there the the new address and they just uh, connect to the um, to the new link. So I, first time this happened, but <laughs> at least once it was supposed to happen. Let me see if people now can join the meeting and follow live. Let me see. I'll share the link here with the, with the crowd. People always ask me why I don't start a YouTube channel on my own. This yeah. is why. Because I wouldn't even know what to do. <laughs> yes. I had to study a lot in order to at least make it possible to um, to, to to put the, the, the stream from Zoom or from any other platform uh, right uh, directly on YouTube. Uh, it was quite a headache that I had. So, yes, and I guess it's because <laughs> of this. Uh, well, people are joining now, but uh, so maybe we can we can start it now. People are starting to join. We had uh, around uh, 70 people on the other link, and then many people will continue to join the, the live uh, by now. So once again, now, yes, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and good morning for all those that are now following us on my YouTube channel uh, from the Americas. I hope everyone can uh, see us and also hear us uh, properly uh, in case there's some kind of technical problem. Uh, please share with us and uh, please share with me and I'll try to, to fix it. Uh, my today's guest is uh, a former intelligence officer with the, the United States uh, Marine Corps, where he served for uh, 12 years. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong you know, on, on anything. He served as a junior military analyst during Operation Desert Storm and later a chief uh, inspector for the United Nations uh, in Iraq between 1991 and 1998, uh, where he led inspections to find weapons of mass destruction. Presently, he is a pundit, a author, columnist, and also runs a project along with Jeff Norman on YouTube uh, on the website scottreiterextra.com, and he also has a Telegram channel on his own. Uh, he has been a very important voice to be heard over the years for many reasons. First, he has dozens of years of field experience, and second, he knows the industry uh, so to speak, of politics and war. Uh, it's an honor for me to have him with us this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, here is Scott Ritter with us. Uh, Mr. Scott Ritter, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, like I said, it's an honor to have you here with us. Many from our regular audience are used to follow you on different channels. And I don't know if this is exactly the first time you uh, visit Portugal, uh, so to speak. It's the first time I visited Portugal via YouTube. Um, I, I did visit actually Lisbon a couple of years ago, beautiful city, beautiful place. And uh, my fantasy is to uh, surf the big waves off the Portuguese coast. Uh, I said fantasy because I'm not a very good surfer and those waves are too big, but it, they, it looks like it would be a heck of, a, of an opportunity. But no, thank you very much for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. Yes, thank you so much once again. And actually, I live here next to the to the beach, one of the most popular beach areas. And we have the other one, probably you, you have heard of it before, the Nazare. Uh, the big waves that you have here is also uh, very near from, from Lisbon. So if you come to Lisbon, everything is near because we are a small country. On the contrary, the United States is way much different. But uh, I know this is not uh, an intimate talk, but I think it is inevitable to understand uh, your background. I read that you grew up in a family connected to the military branch. What does your family uh, think of a man that gave so much to the armed forces of the United States for decades and now is often seen as a critic of the United States foreign agenda? Well, I mean, my parents were, my, my father, my, both my parents were in the Air Force. My mother um, left uh, early on, she was medically retired uh, as a nurse. Uh, but my father spent a career um, as an officer in the Air Force. Um, like me, they both took an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. And the very first amendment to that Constitution is freedom of speech. Um, they were willing to give their lives for that Constitution. 
the same one that I took an oath when I joined the Marine Corps. And uh, while they're very proud of my service in the Marine Corps, I think they're prouder of the fact that I continue to honor my commitment to the Constitution uh, by speaking out on issues that I um, feel are important, where my voice can contribute to an overall debate, dialogue, and discussion. Uh, you see, to anybody who has served in the military, there is no contradiction between serving in the military and then uh, doing your civic duty as a civilian by speaking truth to power. It's the same thing. It's serving your country. It's serving the Constitution. You have your conscience in the end, right? So you need to speak up every time you, you spot things that you think that are uh, mistakes or there are crimes or whatever that means. But uh, you've been, uh, you also graduated. I also know you, that uh, you graduated in 1979 in Kaiserslautern. I, I suppose you are, uh, you speak German uh, fluently. <laughs> not my kind, but not my case, but uh, at least. No, uh, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> you, make, you make too many assumptions. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> when we, before, before, before we moved to Germany, um, as I said, my father was a career military officer. Um, and I grew up in Hawaii uh, as, a, as a young child. And then um, when I started high school, we moved to Turkey. And um, in Turkey, the, uh, it was a requirement if you were going to function within Turkish society to learn the Turkish language. So I actually spent two years studying the Turkish language and I became fairly proficient at it. When we moved to Germany, I thought it would be the same thing. Um, but what we found in Germany is everybody spoke English and nobody wanted to listen to my horrific German. So I never learned German very well. I, uh, I wish I had, but uh, unfortunately I don't, I, I did. Uh, actually, uh, from my impression is that for, from, from Scandinavian countries, uh, they often feel offended if foreigners uh, try to speak on their own language. Because <laughs> if you're not a native, Please don't try to speak our language. That's pretty much what they were saying. So I was hurting their ears. <laughs> <laughs> that was the, the, the way they thought. So, but you, you gradu graduated in 1979 in Kaiserslautern, which back then was uh, Western Germany and not that distant from Berlin and the German Democratic Republic. So this means that you were actually at the epicenter of the Cold War for years and you witness tensions between West and East very closely. Uh, my question here is, uh, to what extent did this experience uh, influence your career and your view of the world, uh, not only back then, but also present? Well, my time in Germany was the culmination of a childhood uh, spent as the son of a military officer who was serving during the Cold War. Um, you know, when I grew up, um, my father would, uh, he, he would deploy, for instance, one of the first deployments I can remember is he went to Turkey, um, where he was with a squadron that stood strip alert with nuclear weapons, meaning that if there was ever an outbreak of conflict, his airplanes would be flying straight to the Soviet Union with nuclear weapons to bomb them. Um, my father served in Vietnam, which was in a, you know, the hot war part of the Cold War, uh, fighting communism. Uh, you know, I'm just, I'm not here to defend the Vietnam War. I'm saying what it was at the time. Um, in 1968, his squadron was deployed to, 68, 69, deployed to um, Korea, South Korea, uh, at, in the aftermath of the Pueblo Affair, where an uh, American ship was taken by the North Koreans. We almost went to war there. Um, you know, he was involved in the, the, the Vietnamization program in the early 70s. Uh, then we moved to Turkey. Turkey was very much part of the Cold War. I mean, every everybody I knew in Turkey, their fathers were involved in some sort of secret uh, Cold War stuff, whether monitoring Soviet nuclear tests, intercepting Soviet uh, signals, um, something. And then the Germany, you know, the village we were in in Germany, Schlodenbach, which was outside of Kaiserslautern, uh, that first winter, we, we arrived there in November. That winter, they had a military exercise and literally in the farm fields around me, uh, soldiers were dug in and, and training as if it were war. I mean, it's it living in a, in, a, in, a, in a living, breathing G.I. Joe wonderland, literally with tanks, airplanes, helicopters, everything. And that was all the time. It never stopped. All the time they prepared for war, prepared for war, prepared for war. Um, I traveled to Berlin three times when I was uh, living in Germany. Uh, I traveled there by airplane, 
through the corridors, the, the you know the, the same corridors that serve as the uh, Berlin airlift. I went by train, um, you know, which is an interesting concept. Uh, while you're on the train, having the East German soldiers with their dogs come through and check your paperwork. And I traveled by vehicle, where you go through checkpoint Alpha, checkpoint Bravo. Uh, you're on the clock, and if you take too long to get there, they send military police convoys with live ammunition out to rescue you from whatever kidnapped you. Um, this wasn't a joke. This was real. My father was involved. At, you know, he's at headquarters level. He would every once in a while get the the word to you know you got to go in the bunker, meaning could be war. And that the bunker is the nuclear bunker. And they had a code word. My father and my mother they took it from a 1960s book called The Last Babylon. Uh, Last Babylon was a code word used in the book where a guy would call his wife and admit the nuclear weapons were flying. You and the kids need to figure out how to survive without me because. I'm going to die. Um, my father and mother used the same code. And there were several times in the night in the late 1970s where my father would call my mom and say, the last Babylon, and he would disappear into the bunker. This ain't a game. This is real. Nuclear annihilation was real right there. We lived next door to a nuclear weapons storage facility, North Point. It would be hit first. Um, there were times when you'd go to school wondering if how the day is going to end. Uh, because the sun may set, but another sun may rise called a nuclear explosion and it's all over. So this was, this was my reality. So you say, how did it shape me? What do you mean? How did it shape me? It was everything. My entire life, my entire childhood was the cold war and what my father was serving. And so therefore I said, I have to serve too. Believe me, when I graduated, graduated high school, I had one thought and one thought only. How could I quickly get in the military so I could be on the front line here in Germany so I can kill the communists when they come across the border? People joke today about kill a commie for mommy. Oh, man, we meant it. That was a real slogan. Better dead than red. You're darn right. We don't, you know, that was my whole life. So I joined the Army on graduation. Uh, long story short, me and the Army didn't get along. It was still the Vietnam Army. They were smoking dope and a lot of racism. And I said, I don't want to go to war with these guys. So I went in the Marine Corps which turned out to be the best decision I ever made. Um, but I, my first formative years in the Marine Corps was, was focused solely. Look, I studied Russian history in college, not because I loved the Russians, but because I hated them. I wanted to know everything about them, to know your enemy. I had to know my enemy so I could better be in a position to kill them. I studied the language, not because I wanted to have intellectual conversations with them, but I wanted to be able to intercept their communications. I wanted to read their intelligence. I wanted to be able to absorb information so I could better kill them. And I became an intelligence officer with the singular focus of killing Russians. That was it. I went to an artillery unit and we trained, 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 trained 24 seven to kill Russians. So how did my childhood shape me? I just told you, it defined who I was and who I was trying to become early on in my adulthood. Actually, you mentioned the fact that you wanted to learn more about Russian history, Russian language, Russian culture. I often say here on my on my channel that the best way to know uh, the other part we want to study, we want to understand, is to dive into into them. So to get more to know more about their culture, about the the way they live, to spend there as much time as as possible in order to absorb them. Because this is the best way uh, we can actually learn from people who are different from us, regardless if we consider them our enemies, our opponents, uh, our adversaries, it doesn't matter. If you want to learn with it, we shouldn't read books saying, well, Russia is this, this and that. What really gives us our uh, image and opinion about someone or about some country and some society is like in former in 19th century, like the Portuguese to do, for example, in Africa. They send their expeditors to Africa, spend their one, two, three, five years, study their, their civilizations, and then come and tell us what, what findings did you did you get from there. But now I, I see that, for example, not only on the media, uh, but also on universities, Western universities, and I can at least say the examples of many Western Europe universities that actually don't have that in mind. They start from a prejudice they have, and then they start. They want to get as much facts as they, they, they have in order to confirm that their prejudice actually is science, is evidence. Um, do you think, that, do you have that same sense in America too? 
Yeah, I, what I can say is this. Um, when I was in college, and I, I, I went to college in the early 1980s, uh, I had some of the finest professors one could ever hope for. Um, but these were professors who had, when they taught Russian history, they taught it because they had studied in the Soviet Union. They had, they had, they, they, they spoke the language because they were from the Soviet Union, or you know, they, 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 they grew up there. They, they knew who the Russian people were. So when they tried to teach me, I remember my, I had a wonderful professor, a Professor Allen, who taught me about uh, the history of Saint Petersburg, um, and the history of Pushkin, uh, and Dostoevsky. Um, but he literally spent his life pouring himself into that. And I poured myself into his classes. I studied, I read, I did everything necessary. And he was so frustrated because he knew that I was going to go and join the, the Marines. <laughs> and he was just like, no, don't waste this talent that you have. You have a talent that's based upon intelligence and humanity and you need to find a way to work with the russians to overcome these difficulties but don't join the military and he would send me essays about russian officers who graduated um in from various academies in saint petersburg in the 19th century and how they were filled with patriotism and they went off to serve and they died and he was saying this is going to be your fate don't become one of these officers become a man of peace and um he Truly, he cried when I graduated because I graduated in my uniform and I was commissioned one of the proudest days of my life. And he was crying because he was like, no, don't do this. And all my history professors were just aghast at the concept that I was going to do, do this. I, I went back before the Gulf War after I because, well, now we come to the, the, the important part. They sent me to the Soviet Union, <laughs> the Marines, <laughs> me. All I want to do is kill these people. And they picked me to be part of this inspection team. And I went there. And uh, I'll get to that in a second. But I came back from that experience, and I, it, it changed me. It was a life-changing event, fundamentally life-changing event. Because as you said, it wasn't just book knowledge. I was now there amongst them. It wasn't theoretical. It was real. These were people. These were human beings with families that had the same hopes and aspirations and desires. They laughed, they cried, they did everything we did. They did it with a different language, maybe with a different cultural um, foundation, but it was the same thing. And I went back to uh, my college after this um, and my professors invited me to come in and speak about my experiences. And they were just so happy that I was, I had been changed. What they did, what they found out was, there was I was heading off to the Gulf War. Iraq had invaded Kuwait. And after I finished with this, I was going to war, straight to war. And they were like, oh, we finally won you over. We pulled you back from the dark side. You're with us now. You see the light, and now you're going to war. Such is the nature of military service. But the uh, my experience in the Soviet Union was, as I said, it was just forever altering. Um, look, I... I I'm not going to pretend. I mean, you can hear by talking to me. I'm not some stuck-up elitist. I don't. I, I. I don't pretend to be something I'm not. Okay. I know who I am. I know what I'm capable of. I know what I'm not capable of. I'm very realistic about my limitations, and they are many. Um, but I have had the opportunity to do things that nobody else has had the opportunity. And you know, I. I learned early on. How do you become an expert in something? People say, like, "Well, you study. You study. You study. You study." I said, "Nope." Become an expert by being the first person to do it. Now you're the only person in the world that did it. And when they say, we need the expert, there's only one guy who did it. It's Ritter. He's the expert. Bring him in. And now you do it again. Now you're twice as qualified as everybody else. The third time, the fourth time. That was my entire, I got to be the first person to do things. And therefore, I became the expert. Not because I was very overly qualified. It's just circumstance. And I was very lucky in that in that regard. But um. You know, it's hard. I, you know, I'm 61 years old, so sometimes it's hard to connect with a younger audience um, about what it was like to go to the Soviet Union. And so I, I, I tried, you know, my kids were raised on Harry Potter. I'm sure you're familiar with Harry Potter. Um, and what made Harry Potter wonderful wasn't the wars that took place at the end of the, the, the movies and the series. It was the first book. The first book is Harry Potter discovered magic and discovered the world of magic. And it was just this 
experiences, learn experience. So now imagine me, somebody who has spent his whole time studying the Soviet Union from afar, reading books, seeing movies, you know, getting the lectures, uh, listening to language. But now I come off the airplane in Moscow and it's like Harry Potter discovering magic. It's like, oh my God, there's the Kremlin. Oh my God, that's Lenin's tomb. Holy cow, I'm at the Bolshoi Theater. I am literally here in the Soviet Union. Oh Jesus, there's a Soviet citizen. They want to talk to me. Oh my God, what am I gonna do? I mean, literally that was my, I was, I was literally the starstruck person. Not because I was intimidated. It was just having read about it. Now you're there and you're doing it. Um, I, I was quickly brought down to earth because we had a very important job to do. It was a very difficult job that we did. We built a facility in the middle of nowhere outside of a Soviet missile factory um, under conditions that are indescribable. Um, but we did it. We accomplished the mission. It was, and we did it together with the Soviets. It wasn't us coming in and pulling them aside. We could not have done what we did without the Soviets working with us as a team in cooperative fashion. And, and remember, we were opponents in the treaty. We were, it's not like they were saying, we surrender, take. They were saying, this is what the treaty allows you to do. Let's work together to do it. And we did it. It was wonderful. It was also taking place during the time of perestroika. I mean, the, the month I arrived, June 1988, uh, Gorbachev held the 19th All-Party Union Conference, where he basically declared a revolution, uh, the beginning of the process of changing the way the Soviet Union governed itself from this strict communist-centric thing to something more that was democratic. And I was there. I got to watch the first elections. I got to listen, watch as Glasnost took over their press. Uh, when I first arrived, the Soviet press was the Soviet press. And then it suddenly became more, uh, more open than anything in the West, where they were asking hard questions, demanding answers. You learned everything about Soviet society. And I lived there. I'd read the newspapers and then go out and see what they were talking about right there in Vodkinsk. It was the greatest experience of my life. And it had nothing to do with killing people. It had everything to do with learning to love of people. And I don't mean love in the romantic thing. I mean, love as this, these are people. These are people just like me. I don't want to kill them. I don't want to bring harm to them. I actually want to protect them. I want to work with them so that I felt bad when their economy started to collapse because it wasn't that I was looking at them going, ah, oh, you dirty commies, you're getting what you deserve. It was, holy cow, they're hungry. Holy cow, they're, they're, they're hurting. They don't have money to do this. They're, you know, they're, these are proud people and this is happening to them. What can, you know, and, and, and so when I left the Soviet Union two years later, um, I was fundamentally a changed man. I mean, my goal before that in the Marine Corps, there were some really good intelligence jobs. One, of course, was to serve as an attache in Moscow to spy. <laughs> Remember, I'm an intelligence officer. <laughs> I ain't no candy boy. <laughs> I'm the real deal. And you know, I wanted to spy against these guys. I really did. I wanted to go out there and get all their secrets and help my side overcome their thing. And Moscow was the place to do it, to be a defense attache. Then the other great job was at the military liaison mission in Germany, East Germany, in Potsdam. It was a group of about 14 Americans whose job description was to spy on the Soviets. That's it. You got into these hyped up vehicles and you drove around East Germany and you spied on the Soviets. You took photographs, you tried to take them. I wanted that job more than anything else in the world. No particular targets, just spy on the Soviets. Or oh, the no, Soviet in the intelligence business, you're given targets. Uh, you, you, you yeah, know, that's why. The whole collection thing, you're told, there's a new tank. Go find out what kind of armor, reactive armor they have on the tank. We see that they might have brought in a new artillery piece. Go take a photograph of that. Uh, go get this, go that. One of the big things these guys did was something called sand dune. Talk about it now. Sand dune, when the, when the, uh, you know, the Soviets go out and do their exercise, um, they, would, they would throw their garbage into a big pit, including the garbage was uh, latrines. <laughs> and they would use whatever paper was necessary for their business. And sometimes they would take pages out of a code book and use it. And so these guys would go in and dig up the latrines and fill a bag full of this paper that they'd then take and do whatever they had to do to get it to be exploited. But 
but you'd go through there and, and you could break codes. I mean, that's the real world of intelligence. It ain't as sexy as everybody thinks it is. <laughs> you know. But anyways, I wanted to do that. But when I left that, the, the Soviet Union, or, you know, I went to war and we could talk about the war if you wanted to, but I had what they call a good war, meaning I lived and I did my job very well. I was involved in counter scud stuff that that's what got me into Iraq. But when I finished the, the war, the commandant of the Marine Corps, and this is a big honor for me because I was just a captain. I'm very, very junior. And the commandant of the Marine Corps, who is the number one Marine, um, was begging me to stay in the Marines. He said that I was one of the best intelligence officers he's ever met that I was the future of Marine Corps intelligence and I needed to stay in the Marine Corps. And that's a lot of pressure. But I was looking at it from the standpoint of, I joined the Marines to, to fight communism, fight the Soviet Union, fight Russians. And that, that no longer is what dr I, I'm driven about. I mean, I, I fought in my war, I fought against Iraq, served my country, but I don't wanna spend the rest of my life fighting other people. I joined because I was a child of the Cold War, because I was taught from a very young age that the enemy was communism. The enemy was the Russians. And now the enemy is no longer communism. It's no longer the Russians. You can't call me a coward because I already did that war thing. And while I did it well, I can't say it, it was the biggest thrill factor of my life. And I don't necessarily want to do that more. I, I'd like to go and work with the work in the Soviet Union to help them through this perestroika thing. So I was going to get out of the Marine Corps, work with a company called H.J. Heinz. You might know them. They make ketchup, but they also do food processing. And so the idea was that I was going to go to a town called Piatigorsk, where they're going to build a factory. I was going to manage the construction of that factory, just like I helped manage the construction of that arms control facility outside of the factory. That was my goal. That's why I left the Marine Corps. Did you go to, to Russia in the 90s, at least to see the difference between the, those times you spent in the Soviet Union and then the after so the dissolution of the Soviet Union or uh, not necessarily? I, the last time I was in Moscow was in November of 1991. So it was still the Soviet Union. So I have never been to Russia, to the Russian Federation. Um, I hope to at some point, but I have never been to the Russian Federation. I've only set foot in Soviet Union. So you were there uh, in the Soviet Union when the first McDonald's opened in Moscow. When when what? The first McDonald's opened. I I have a photograph of me eating at the first McDonald's in Moscow. Yes, I I, I was there. We uh we were we 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 ate a meal in McDonald's in in Moscow. Uh, yay, capitalism. <laughs> no, it was pretty much different. At least I, I, last time I went to Russia, um, it was on February this year, just a week before the, the, the military intervention started in Ukraine. Uh, and there were more than 900 McDonald's everywhere. So capitalism is everywhere. But there are still uh, a lot of restaurants from the Soviet times, from Russian cuisine, which actually I don't see that much in the West. So uh, most of these McDonald's restaurants usually were attended by uh, tourists or by younger generations, recent generations. R when I say young, I see, I, I, I mentioned teenagers, uh, college students, uh, not more older than that. So uh, even those that are in the 30s, 40s, like me, for example, they don't go to it they, they don't attend the mcdonald's they go to the restaurants like uh, any other russian uh, of russian cuisine but uh, all that experience that you had uh, you were also like you said a senior analyst and also uh, a spy uh, on the, the 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 soviet union regarding the soviet union but you were also a senior analyst concerning the soviet intervention in afghanistan um, do you consider that after all these years, do you still understand well uh, the, the way the Soviets and the Russians way of thinking? Do you think that not much has changed since then? No, I think a lot has changed. I mean, um, Russia's gone through a lot. Uh, the, the decade of the 90s was something that I don't think we in the West can fully comprehend. Even Westerners who were in Russia in the 1990s, uh, we, we went there, when I say we, I wasn't there. The people who went there, went there not to become one with Russia, but to manage Russia. Some would even say to exploit Russia, 
to impose their way on Russia, to re-educate the Russians. Um, some would say to colonize the Russians. I mean, you can come up with, the bottom line is the decade of 90s was horrible if you were Russian. There was a handful of people that did well, the oligarchs and some of the, uh, the, the, the ruling class who enriched themselves off of the corpse of the Soviet Union. But for the average Russian, um, it was a horrible, horrible time. And like my experience prior to going to the Soviet Union, I can only read about that from long distance. I've talked, we have relatives that are there who lived it, but again, I'm only hearing it secondhand or firsthand from them, um, but I'm not experiencing it. Um, but I think that that's one of those, it's like saying, let's, let's say that I studied America during the, um, the, 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 the Mexican War. Um, and then and then the periods of the 1840s and the 1850s. Uh, um, that's it. Well, I understand America very well. Then we had the Civil War. That changed everything. And so the America that emerged after the Civil War could not be said to be the same America that existed 15 years prior. So while I can say that I was a Soviet expert, um, I can't today say that I'm a Russian expert. I'm trying, but I would have to dig deeper into what happened in the 1990s. I mean, I'm aware of it, but I think that that decade forever had an impact on, um, on everybody from Vladimir Putin on down. Uh, it was a transformative decade that we in the West don't understand. So if we try to interpret what's going on in Russia based upon a Soviet point of view, you know, foundation, we're wrong because that the, the Soviet Union's gone. This is Russia, and Russia is defined by the decade of the 90s and by the frustration of the early 2000s, where Russia was trying to integrate with the West, but was being blocked by the West because the West didn't know how to deal with strong strong Russian leader like Vladimir Putin. They wanted a weak Russian leader like Boris Yeltsin. They wanted Russia to be subservient, compliant, not, you know, not, not independent um, and, and, and strong. Um, so I'm doing my best to try and understand Russia today, but it is a work in progress. Uh, at least I'm open to the reality that I don't know all that I need to know about Russia. And I think that's one of the mistakes that's made in the West. Uh, is that we 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 come into Russia, especially the elite, the, the academic elite, political elite. We we approach Russia is, uh, based upon what we want Russia to be, not what Russia is. See, we we people like Michael McFall, Fiona Hill, Angela Stent, all of these so-called Russian experts, they're not experts on Russia. I've read everything they've written, and I can tell you they know nothing about Russia. The Russia they talk about is the Russia they want, not the Russia that is. I'm yeah. trying to understand the Russia that is. Indeed, and that's that demands quite a, quite a lot of work in order to understand at least the minimums or the basics, because we are uh, familiarized with a, a different way of, of thinking, of living, of everything. And this sometimes there is on in the Western uh, societies, uh that difficultness to understand differences that's why we have presently the cultural relativism versus the uh, universal ethics like we want to spread the, the our notion of human rights and democracy worldwide and we totally forget and we don't care about what the the other kind of peoples uh, want uh, and think about this these kind of subjects but it's curious that you that you give that answer because even last sunday we had in our Portuguese uh, news channel, uh, public news channel, there was a political pundit that described uh, Vladimir Putin as the communist regime of Vladimir Putin. Come on, 31 years after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, there are still people thinking and looking at Russia as being the Soviet Union. So uh, what else can you do about that? Like the, the same goes for the, that Alexander Dugin, is the mentor of Vladimir Putin, another myth. 
So people don't know who Dugin is. I actually think that Dugin is much more valued than followed in North America rather than in on Russia itself. But people still look uh, at these kind of uh, concepts that they have and that they hear. They have some book knowledge, like we called uh, talked before, uh, and then they just don't want to confirm if that information is actually correct or wrong. So if it confirms my prejudice, that's all fine. And people listen to this kind of, of lies, uh, of this information. And then that's why many people here in the West, especially in Europe, they have uh, such a negative opinion about uh, about Russia itself and looking at Russia as being uh, some kind of Soviet Union 2.0 or something like that. But um, I know that you have been listed as an enemy of Ukraine on the Mirat Voryets website. Uh, here in Europe, uh, we often hear that uh, this is just a list with intent to clarify the, the public opinion about who can be considered a Russian propagandist, but we also hear that this is some kind of uh, kill list of targets that if possible, and if people can target these people uh, in the worst way, uh, the best. Uh, you were also added to the list of speakers uh, who promote narratives concerning with Russian propaganda by the uh, Ukrainian Center for Countering Disinformation, uh, especially regarding Mirat Voryets. Uh, how do you look at this? Okay. As an intelligence officer, I'm going to, you know, I go through the exercise. If I were Ukrainian, how would I view Scott Ritter? Um, and I would say that I would be extraordinarily concerned about the Scott Ritter phenomenon. That uh, for whatever reason, this, uh, this, this, this hick American, uneducated uh, guy has caught the attention of a community that listens to what he's saying. Um, and the facts that he puts there are inconvenient to us. Uh, you see, it's one thing to sit there and say, I want to, I mean, the, the way I would approach something, let's say you and I disagree on something. All right. The, the Ukrainian side would say, I need to go across the seas and kick your butt and shut you up forever. The American in me says, we need to have a debate, dialogue, a discussion. Um, maybe you, you have a point of view that I haven't considered yet. Maybe you have some facts that I haven't considered yet. Um, maybe we need to have this discussion to figure out why we disagree. What, what do we disagree on? What do we agree on, and how can we move this forward in a in a in a in a um, constructive manner? The Ukrainians don't want to play that game. I mean, I've challenged them to a debate. Any one of them <laughs> debate. If you have a problem with what I'm saying about Bucha, if you have a problem with what I'm saying about uh, the Ukrainian offensive, if you have a problem with what I'm saying about Ukraine's relationship with NATO, um, don't try to silence me because I'm an American and I can't be silenced. It just isn't going to work, guys. First Amendment, oath to the Constitution, uphold and defend with my life. You see, I am willing to die for this cause, not the Russian cause, but the free speech cause. You threaten my life because I'm speaking? Take it. Do it. This is the fight I want to have. Not necessarily the physical one. I'm 61 years old. I'm not quite as fast as I think I am and maybe not as strong as I am, but the mental fight, the spiritual fight. You know, the fundamental fight about right and wrong, lies and truth. Let's have this fight. They don't want to. They don't want to have that fight. They want to physically intimidate people. They want to employ the tools of the cancel culture. Let's talk about the Center for Countering Disinformation. They've labeled me an information terrorist <laughs> and a war criminal. Now, legally, um, these are just interesting concepts. I don't even know how they begin to approach this from a legal standpoint, but they're important rhetorical flourishes. You see, they also have called me a Russian propagandist. And in the United States, when you're labeled a Russian propagandist, um, that immediately shuts down all sorts of opportunities. Uh, I used to write for several outlets. They know who they are. I don't need to mention them. And if you do a brief uh, Google of who I used to write for and who I'm not writing for now, you can figure it out. Um, you know, and I was doing very well with them. Uh, the stuff I was writing for them were their most popular. Literally, one article that I wrote for this one outlet was the most popular article of everything they published in a certain year. 
Um, the same thing with another outlet. One was sort of a conservative outlet. The other one was a very liberal outlet. So the notion that I'm tied to a political direction is absurd. I'm tied to truth, fact-based truth and the exploration of the truth, not political left and right kind of stuff. They both dropped me because I was a Russian propagandist. I mean, it's absurd. I'm not a Russian propagandist. I'm a Russian historian. I'm a Russian analyst. You know, <laughs> there's a, uh, a movie. Um, I'm going to go down. You told me in front I could do this. So I'm going to do it. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. a, famous, a famous American movie that people might be familiar with, uh, My Cousin Vinny, um, with Joe Pesky. Uh, he plays a lawyer, but he's defending this kid who was interviewed by a cop. And uh, in the interview, the cop uh, you know, says, um, yeah, you killed the clerk. And the kid goes, I killed the clerk. I killed the clerk. But in the trial, the cop was reading the transcript. I killed the clerk. I killed the clerk, as if it's a confession. You know, and I looked at that and I was like, you know, people call me a Russian propagandist. You know, <laughs> I'm a Russian propagandist. I'm a Russian, but now it's going to be read. I'm a Russian propagandist. I'm a Russian propagandist. <laughs> I'm not a Russian propagandist. Um, but the, then it brings up another movie. Um, you may have seen A Few Good Men, where um, Tom Cruise is, uh, you know, uh, interrogating Jack Nicholson's character. You know, and it, so you want to call me a Russian? Man? I just imagine Tom Cruise. You know, we need the truth. In my response, you can't handle the truth. Are oh, you a Russian propagandist? You're damn right, I'm a Russian propagandist. Why? Not because I'm a Russian propagandist, because as Jack Nicholson explained on there, you know, it's the same thing with there's people on the wall. I'm on the wall of truth. Okay, is it a Russian to be a Russian propagandist? Are you a Russian propagandist if you call out the fact that the Bandera ideology, Stepan Bandera, the ultra white supremacist Ukrainian nationalist ideology? That that's evil. Am I a Russian propagandist for calling this out? Am I a Russian propagandist for understanding that when an American politician or a Canadian politician or any politician, a Western politician, shouts out Slava Ukraina, that it's the same thing as saying Sigil? The same thing. Now, are you going to tell me that you don't understand what Sigil means? That you don't know that those two words to victory is forever affiliated with? Nazi Germany, Adolf Hitler, the same way Slava Ukraine. You can't just say glory to Ukraine. No, no, no. Bandera ruined that for everybody. He made that his rallying cry that was used by his forces as they slaughtered and butchered tens of thousands of Jews, hundreds of thousands of Poles, hundreds of thousands of Russians. Slava Ukraine, glory to the heroes, was the last thing those people heard before they burned to death in the barn that they were stuck into and lit on fire by the Bandera people. Slava Ukraina, it means Sigheil. It is to the Bandera movement, it Sigheil was to the hit to, 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 to Nazi Germany. Don't pretend that otherwise. Am I a Russian propagandist? No. But if telling the truth makes me a Russian propagandist, of being on the right side of history makes me a Russian propagandist, then I'm a Russian propagandist. Not because I'm propagandizing on behalf of Russia, but I'm propagandizing on behalf of the truth. And if Russia's telling the truth, then Russia's on the right side of history, and I'm proud to be with them. Those examples you, you mentioned actually made me remember uh, what, it, what actually happened in 1998 and 1999 in Kosovo. Because at first, the Kosovo Liberation Army, they were considered as a drug trafficking organization, a terror organization, and all of a sudden, they start to be considered as freedom fighters. Freedom fighters. Now we must provide support to them because they need to be uh, helped in order to be freed from the, 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 the regime of Yugoslavia. So it's almost exactly the same thing or like the Afghanistan, uh, the, the, the help and the, the, all the help pro support provided to uh, not only Osama bin Laden, but also for the Mujahideens in Afghanistan. Uh, suddenly something that is considered to be a, a terrorist organization fastly becomes a freedom fighter organization. And I think that one of the problems uh, that arise from there is that uh, it actually is originating from the fact that there is no specific notion of what terrorism is. 
from the study I pursued uh, recently, there is at least 250 different notions of terrorism. And uh, the majority of them, they can be used against everything any kind of phenomenon, any kind of concept. So uh, how are you going to call now the information terrorism or terrorism of information? Is that the, the, the name that they labeled you, right? Uh, terrorist of information. I mean, uh, how can we actually uh, see credibility uh, and trust in institutions that actually label people according to uh, absolutely no standards. There are no standards, <laughs> there's nothing objective. And the, the, what worries me the most is then to see the media uh, spreading just that message without even trying to confirm if uh, if that makes sense. I don't I, I don't even want to say that if it is true, if, if that at least makes sense. They just spread this, this message and then you are labeled as a Russian propagandist, I am daily labeled as a Russian propagandist because I have uh, interventions on the Portuguese TV. Uh, and each time I say or I write anything concerning the, the this conflict, and if it is dissonant to the main story that they want to spread among the, the, the audience, then I'm labeled the Russian propagandist as well. So I, I know what you feel. I also participated uh, two years ago in a report about Ukraine being used as a nest of uh, neo-Nazis. Uh, at least until then, Ukraine was considered to be the center of neo-Nazis in Europe. Now, suddenly, they are no longer neo-Nazis. There are just a dozen Nazis, and we need to support them. Uh, Facebook just unblock them, and they, they allow them to spread the message. All this is very strange because I thought that we were in a society that uh, accuses, for example, the East, Eastern Europe and uh, Eastern Asia as well um, of tackling and uh, uh, boycotting uh, free, uh, pers uh, individual freedoms. And actually what you see here is exactly the, the opposite. But uh, regarding these concepts and these notions, uh, you served as a junior analyst on Operation Desert Storm which was the second phase of the military intervention led by the United States in response to the Iraqi uh, intervention of uh, Kuwait, uh, which was then called the Gulf War. Uh, NATO's campaign in former Yugoslavia to liberate Kosovo uh, was called Operation Allied Force. Then the second intervention in Iraq uh, was often referred to as military operation. Uh, the military intervention in Libya was called Operation Odyssey Storm. And finally, the so-called special military operation conducted uh, in Syria was also officially called Operation Inherent Resolve. But now we have people angry because the Russians used the name special military operation in Ukraine uh, since February 24. Uh, in fact, people in the West demand that we call it war. How do you see this? Uh, what differences do you think there are here? And to what extent do you think it's important to focus uh, on the concepts and use them properly uh, regarding each phenomenon. You know, I said, and I say this all the time, and I know it gets a little be redundant, but war is an extension of politics by other means. So we blame Carl von Clausewitz for this. Um, let me let me start with basic principles. Um, dead soldiers don't care what you call it. Okay, dead civilians don't care what you call it. A bullet through the head, whether fired in during wartime or a special military operation or a police action, is still a bullet through the head. You're dead. So let's, you know, at some point in time, the word game just becomes, you know, superfluous. It just doesn't matter because people are dying. Um, so to get caught up in the word games sort of, you know, fails to see the forest for the trees. Um, but that's the war aspect of it. The politics aspect of it is where the word games become very important. Um, Russia's special military operation is totally misunderstood in the West uh, for a number of reasons. Again, this is my analysis and my perception, but as we already have, I've made clear, I'm not a Russian expert. I want to be a Russian expert, but I'm not a Russian expert. I was a Soviet expert, but now I'm a student of Russia, a student of modern day Russia, 
I'm learning. So anybody who's about to take what I'm about to say as a PhD thesis, don't. This is basically uh, at best a master's thesis, maybe only the, 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 the final paper I write at the end of my senior um, you know, uh, 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 seminar. Um, it's, it's a work in progress. I'm still learning. But my understanding is that Russia, you can't call this a war because Russia didn't go to war. Russia didn't declare war. Russia declared a special military operation that was linked to um, the political realities set forth in their explanation of what they did. This was an internal Ukrainian conflict between the Ukrainian government and separatists in the Donbass. Um, the separatists wanted to be independent. They actually self-declared themselves to be independent and they sought to be integrated into Russia. And this was back in 2014, 2015. And Russia said, no, you are part of Ukraine. We will work with the international community through the Minsk uh, process to give you special rights, certain autonomy to protect your linguistic rights, your cultural rights, your status as Russians within the framework of Ukraine. Um, when this failed, after eight years of bombardment, thousands of deaths, uh, a, a refusal on the part of Ukraine in the West to uh, insist that the Minsk Accords be um, implemented, Russia was now confronted with how do we help these people, these Russians? Um, so the first thing that had to happen is you have to change the political environment away from an internal Ukrainian conflict. And you do that by having Donetsk and Lugansk declare their independence. And then you recognize their independence. And this is important because Russia now is not dealing with an internal Ukrainian conflict. Russia is dealing with two newly declared um, independent states. It doesn't matter if the rest of the world doesn't recognize it from a purely legal standpoint, Russia recognizes them. Then Russia now can create what's called a collective security arrangement with these people so that the security interests of these two states is now joined with Russia. But still, how do you go to war? Because the Ukrainians aren't attacking Russia, they're attacking these states. Um, how can Russia say self-defense? In order to talk about self-defense, you have to be physically attacked. And this had to be something that was such a scale that it was a game changer. You can't cite the ongoing Ukrainian attacks against the, the Donbass. There has to be something new. And this was the tens of thousands of Ukrainian troops that were being brought into eastern Ukraine, preparing for an imminent military assault on the Donbass. Now Russia can say there's an imminent threat to the collective security arrangement that requires preemptive self-defense under Article 51 of the United Nations Charter. And Russia is 100% legally correct in shaping it this way, but it's not war. It is a special military operation that's designed to eliminate a threat to the collective security um, arrangement that exists between Donbas, Lugansk, and Russia. Now, people say, that's just too cute, Scott. Yay, you're, a, you're one of those guys who twists the law to mean anything. And I say, yep, yeah, welcome to the real world. You know who else twisted the law? You want to know where Russia got the idea of citing preemptive self-defense using a collective security arrangement in a European environment? Kosovo. Serbia, 1999, it's the exact same case that the United States, NATO made to justify their war of aggression against Serbia. The only difference is that NATO had to make up an imminent threat. The imminent threat cited was, of course, the ongoing genocide carried out by the Serbians against the Kosovars. There was no genocide by the Serbians against the Kosovars. It was a manufactured case, but the imminent assault against the Donbass was real. Those troops were there. There were orders ready. They were ready to go. So not only did Russia use the same legal argument that NATO used to take out Serbia, Russia did it right by telling the truth about the imminent nature of the threat. Now, how does Russia respond to that imminent nature of the threat? They didn't declare war. Um, 
they declare a special military operation. They went, they carried out the special military operation using um, a limited amount of resources. And I think history will show that this was a big mistake on the part, of, a huge mistake on the part of Russia. I think history will show that Russia had one of the greatest intelligence failures in modern history, where they actually were told that the Ukrainian military would stay in the barracks, the Ukrainian uh, civil structure would stand down as Russian troops moved in rapidly to confront the Ukrainian government with the, the wrongness of their ways to get a surrender to achieve what they wanted, which was an independent Donbass and a Ukraine that was forever neutral would not join NATO. Well, that didn't work out. The Ukrainian you military think that was the biggest mistake that Russia did since the beginning of this special military operation. It undoubtedly was. Look, this this was a war that should have been fought and won within within weeks. There's no reason why Ukraine should still be existing today. If Russia had gone to war against Ukraine, this war would be over, finished. But they didn't. They went, and I'll tell you why. This is why we in the West, anybody who says that you're a Russian expert and you cannot articulate what the special military operation is, um, then you're not a Russian expert. The special military operation isn't special because it's a military operation. It's special because it's about Russia and Ukraine. It's about the bond, the cultural bond, at least from the perspective of Russia. What we're finding out now is that many in Ukraine don't share the same mindset that the Russians have, whereas the Russians have this feeling of um, a, a, a Slavic identity, a common Slavic bond. Many in Ukraine, especially those in the West, don't feel that way about the Russians. It's not a mutual love and respect. The Russians view Ukraine as part of the, not just the Soviet, the former Soviet empire, but the former Russian empire prior to that. These territories are part of a larger Russia, especially in the east part of Ukraine, Crimea and Novoya Russia. Um, Ukrainians don't share the same image, and that's one of the mistakes that the Russians made, trying to mirror image their belief system on a Ukrainian population that didn't necessarily share the, the same warmth. Uh, the Russians went in and, and to, in, in, in a sort of a low-key manner. Uh, they didn't come in hard. They didn't come in with the full weight of the Russian military. They came in with a limited number of forces attempting to do something that was uh, that would reduce the violence inflicted on Ukrainian civilians, reduce the damage inflicted on Ukrainian infrastructure, and reduce the casualties inflicted on the Ukrainian military. Um, they failed because the Ukrainians didn't play that game, and Russia has been on their back foot ever since. It's been very violent for both sides. Uh, the Russians prevailing, but it wasn't quick as quick, and it wasn't as uh, you know. It, it was far more destructive than the Russians had originally intended. The game changer was when NATO decided to intervene on the part of uh, Ukraine and provide them with tens of billions of dollars worth of financial assistance, military assistance. And they basically took a Ukrainian military that the Russians were grinding down. Russia had destroyed the Ukrainian military by the summer, by this past summer, summer 22, June, July. I mean, we're, we're talking hundreds of thousands of casualties. But in, instead of being able to confront the Ukrainian government with the inevitability of their defeat by pointing to the destroyed Ukrainian military, the Ukrainian government was able to respond with a reconstituted military brought in by NATO um, and now attack the Russians who were overextended. Again, you come in with 200,000 troops based on the premise that the Ukrainians are going to surrender, and now you're confronted not only with severe Ukrainian resistance, but a new reconstituted Ukrainian military doubling down on the conflict. Russia didn't have enough troops. And we saw in September when the Ukrainians counterattacked, the Russians were compelled to consolidate their defenses by withdrawing from Kharkov. Uh, we saw what happened in Kherson. They made a decision to withdraw from the right, right bank. bank. Yeah, see, I get that wrong. So, I'm, I'm, so I, I look at a map and I, I go, oh, the you know, north, south, the left bank, the right bank. No, you got to come down the direction of the river, left and right. Go the flow. Oh, right. Uh, again. Remember, I told you I'm a simple Marine. I'm not some, one of these gigantic mental guys. I got to learn this thing. But uh, the point is they withdrew, they consolidated, and they're still consolidating. Everybody's like, ah, the Russians partially mobilized. Yeah, they did. And 87,000 of those troops have come in and have consolidated defense. 
hey, Ukraine, there's 200,000 plus more coming. That's 10 to 15 divisions that you don't have. You don't have them, Ukraine, because you squandered everything in achieving these results. The Russians are playing the propaganda game. If, if Zelensky wants to visit Kherson, visit Kherson. Have, enjoy your moment. 10 to 15 Russian divisions are about to arrive in the next month or so that Ukraine doesn't have a response to. And at that point in time, I think we're going to, now we're going to see Russia transitioning, even though they're going to continue to call it a special military operation, it's become more warlike. And we're seeing that today. Today, there's a huge bombardment of, uh, throughout, throughout Ukraine, including Western Ukraine. Um, Russia's educating the Ukrainians and the world on what war looks like. And again, for the soldier that took a bullet in the head back in February, in March, it doesn't matter what you call it. But for the politicians now, it's becoming a war. They may call it a special military operation, but it's about to turn into an outright war. So do you think that the present situation um, can be changed? You, do you believe that Russia will go back again to the right bank of the Dnieper River uh, and want, really want to go further until at least Odessa? Or do you think that Russia will try only to consolidate its present positions and uh, try to see if they can, can come out uh, with a peace deal uh, with Ukraine, with all this present uh, land? What do you think? Article 64, I believe, of the Russian Constitution sort of answers the question. I think that deals with the, the Mother Russia. Uh, you, you can't give away Mother Russia. You can't. And since these territories were incorporated into Russia, understand that while Ukrainian troops might be in the right bank of, of the Dnieper River occupying Kherson, that's Mother Russia. And the Russians have never stopped calling it Mother Russia. So this war won't end until Russia has not only secured the totality of the territory that constitutionally comprises Russia, but has advanced sufficiently to push Ukrainian artillery away from, uh, out of range of Russian territory. Russia cannot tolerate continued Ukrainian shelling of mother Russia. So they're going to do that um, at a minimum. Now, the Russians have also said that this conflict won't end until they've achieved all the stated objectives of the special military operation. There's two main objectives, denazification, demilitarization. Start with the easy one, demilitarization. Originally just meant to remove all NATO influence from the Ukrainian military. The Russians weren't seeking to destroy the Ukrainian military. But now that the Ukrainian military has become a de facto proxy of NATO, NATO equipped, NATO trained, NATO led, NATO intelligence, NATO logistics, everything, um, demilitarization means the complete and utter destruction of the Ukrainian military. Russia can't afford to have a situation emerge where Ukraine continues to exist as a hostile state. That's a cancer. Russia's objective is a new European security framework as defined by the documents they provided to NATO and the United States back in December 17th of last year. That's their ultimate objective. That's what they want. You can't achieve that objective if Ukraine is a cancerous, festering infection uh, there that continues to try and spread its infection to Russia. Demilitarization means the entire Ukrainian military is wiped off the face of the earth. They can choose to do so by surrendering. They can choose to do so by retreating out of Ukrainian soil, or they can choose to do so by fighting and dying on the battlefield. One way or another, there will not be a Ukrainian military by the time this is done. Denazification is the more difficult one, because now we're getting into a political problem that has as its roots, um, not just a handful of politicians, but society, Ukrainian society. You know, in 2019, just to show you how wrong the West has been about um, the, 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 the depths to which this Nazi ideology has infected Ukraine. 2019, the Ukrainian parliament passed a law that made, I think it's called the Plank movement, the, uh, the scouting movement, uh, the only scouting movement that's permitted in Ukraine. There's no other scouting movement. Like, Ritter, what are you doing? It's scouts. Leave them alone, dude. Leave them alone. They're just Boy Scouts. Let them do what they do. No, they're not just Boy Scouts. That's just like telling the Hitler Youth just Boy Scouts. So the Hitler Youth is about promoting the ideology of uh, you know, Nazism as defined by Adolf Hitler. The Plank Movement is about promoting the ideology of Ukrainian nationalism through, through Stepan Bandera, their hero. <laughs> Roman, I can't remember his last name, uh, Stepovich, something like that. He's Shukovich, Shukovich, I think it was. 
uh, the guy who led the Nightingale units, the Roland units, the people who jammed them into barns and burned them. Horrible, horrible people. These are the heroes of the Plank Movement, of the Scouts. They carry the portraits. They carry the black and red flag. They shout Slava Ukraina and glory, you know, glory to the heroes, not because they believe in Ukraine or the heroes, because that is the murderous rant of Stepan Bandera. It exists. It became the law. It, it's not just that it's about scouting. Any youth activity, any youth activity in Ukraine must be done through the vehicle of the Plank movement. They are mainstreaming Stepan Bandera's ultranationalism through the children to ensure that as they go forward, all Ukrainians buy into this odious, noxious ideology. Um, Denazification, how do you begin to remove this from a society? Um, and that's the hardest question out there. What will constitute? I think Russia will ultimately have to be compelled to make some sort of compromise here. This is the most dangerous part of the Russian special military operation. Because in order to truly denazify, you would have to occupy all of Ukraine and subject all of the Ukrainians to um, re-education. It's been, it's been tried once. Um, you know, the, the, the Soviets captured a whole bunch of these Banderas back in the 1950s. And they should have shot them, but they didn't. They put them in the gulag and they re-educated. Then they released them back to Ukrainian society where they festered and they continued this underground movement and they hated the Russians and they hate Moscow and they hate everything. Um, I'm not saying, the last thing I'm saying is kill people. No, I'm just saying it's, this could be a mission impossible because does Russia, the 300,000 troops that they mobilized may allow them to capture Odessa, link up with Transistria, maybe occupy Kharkov. It doesn't give them enough troops to actually occupy Western Ukraine and in the Kiev region at the same time. But unless you do that, how do you change? I think ultimately there will be a compromise where whatever the post Zelensky government is, they will undertake the constitutional changes that outlaw Bandera, outlaw that ideology, remove the statues, remove the, you know his, his, his status as a hero to ban mention of his name. But when there's going to be people in Ukraine who will have their basement um, room where they'll have a bar and they'll all get together and they'll drink to the glory of Ukraine, not defined by real Ukraine, but Bandera. They're just driving this movement underground and it'll reemerge somewhere down the road. How many generations will it take to actually denazify Ukraine? Well, I mean, I, I think let, let's look at... Um, the way we can answer that is uh, through the, the person of uh, Christia Freeland, the deputy prime minister of Canada. Her grandfather was a Nazi collaborationist who, who uh, I believe, ran a newspaper in Krakow that uh, glorified the slaughter of Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto, glorified the 14th Galicia Division, a Waffen-SS unit that uh, brutally murdered Poles and Russians and Jews. Um, and um, she... she She's uh, someone today who um, has whitewashed his history, suppressed it, but she was trained as a journalist, so she knows what the truth is. She just has decided to suppress it. And she says, Slava Ukraina, um, but she pretends that it's about Ukraine, but she knows what it means. She's the third generation, and she's still a Nazi. She's still a Nazi, and her children are being raised as Nazis. That's the fourth generation. Um, if you allow this ideology to go underground, you're never going to get rid of it because they're just going to whitewash things and pretend something else. Um, and this is why it's a tough problem, because I, I think basically you, you have to do what Germany did about uh, Adolf Hitler and, 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 and Nazism. But here's the problem. In Germany today, there's still people in their basements who have the rooms with the flags and the the, the, the memorabilia who hold toasts about the glory of the past. Um, I don't think it's a mental illness, to be honest. It's a mental illness. And I, how do you cure a mental illness? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I tend to agree with that, uh, with that view, but how to tackle it? Actually, no, but I had never heard 
of any uh, solution that could seem effective, regardless of the, the banning of the ideology, or, of, or even if they organize themselves as a political parties, like some societies allow them to, to organize. I don't think that could be that would be enough to, to address uh, this scourge. Um, but actually, uh, you mentioned the, the, the biggest mistake, let me put things like this, the, the fact that Russians at first didn't uh, look at this intervention uh, as if they were at, at war and they had a misconception about what would be the, the, the uh, reaction of the, by the Ukrainians and also by the Western community. Uh, do you, can you point out or identify any other mistakes that the Russians committed, at least over the na last nine years, and I'm mentioning about last nine years because uh, I'm considering the Euromaidan and uh, all the Yanukovych uh, crisis that he had to face in Ukraine, at least since the last semester of 2013. Look, <laughs> history <laughs> is, is funny. I mean, but, but there's the old saying, um, you know, hindsight is better than foresight by a darn sight. Meaning that sitting here today, I think we can all look back and, 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 and look at what happened in 2014 and understand that Russia should have backed Yanukovych decisively at that point in time. That, uh, that the way to prevent all this happening would be to make a move on that. But what we don't understand is what the consequences of that would have been. Um, what would have happened to Belarus? We don't know. I mean, Belarus was different back then than it is now. Um, and NATO was far more unified than we, you know, um, it, it, it's, it's very difficult to look back from the benefit of hindsight and say, oh, they should have done this, they should have done that. You have to address it from the situation that existed at that time. Remember, Maidan occurred before Crimea was, was reabsorbed by the Russians. So that means that this was at a time when Russia was actually working overtime, to try and treat Ukraine as an independent state. And everybody doesn't give Putin credit for this, but the Russian government actually bent over backwards to treat Ukraine as an independent sovereign state, um, despite all of the historical pressures to retake Crimea and you know, Novo Rossiya, Donbass, et cetera. Russia was trying to treat Ukraine as an independent state. Was that a mistake? No, I don't believe that was a mistake because I think it gives Russia so much more credibility today than they would have had. Now, the West, you can't look for the credibility from the West because the West is ignorant about Russia. They'll condemn Russia for everything. But ask yourself, why does the world not sanction Russia? Why is it when Russia, when Lavrov shows up at the G20, People are meeting with him, talking with him, even though the West is saying, don't talk to him, don't meet with him. Why? Because of the credibility Russia brings to the table because they didn't do something stupid, not stupid. They didn't do something um, uh, to, to intervene in, in Maidan. They let, the, it, let it play out. And they have tried from, from 2014 until 2022 to treat the Donbass as an integral part of Ukraine. Um, Russia gets the, the world that actually tries to focus on Russia, the reality, understands. They don't support the Russian invasion, understand that. There's very few people that say, we support the Russian invasion, um, because it's difficult to support any invasion of a country. Um, but they understand that it was not unprovoked. They know that. They understand that Russia has a case they just wish it didn't hadn't come to that. And uh, now that it's happened, I think they're pretty much resigned to the fact that this is going to unfold the way Russia needs it to unfold. And while we're not going to cheerlead for Russia, we're not going to impose sanctions and interfere with this. Um, there's a recognition that the West is wrong in this in this case. You know, again, some of the harshest criticism put at Russia is that they've um, been too tolerant of the West. But again, one of the reasons why Russia has the tacit support of the West is because Russia has behaved in a legal, rational, logical manner. They haven't behaved like the United States. The United States, you mess with me, I'm going to kick your butt. I'm going to come at you. I'm going to punch you. I'm going to intervene. I'm going to sanction you. 
I'm going to do this. It's not been the Russian approach. The Russian approach has been the exact opposite, and many people have perceived that as weakness. It's not. It's actually Russia's strength. And it's played out today because the majority of the world don't view Russia as the aggressor. They view the West as the aggressor. So you can't say that all this stuff that led up to it, which is frustrating if you're somebody who, um, you know, say Russia could have done so much more to be in a better position than they are today. I disagree. Because while they might have prevented some of the the military missteps, they wouldn't have the world surround. The majority of the world supports, not supports the Russian invasion, but supports the Russian cause. Whereas the minority of the world supports the Western. And I think if Russia had behaved differently in the decade leading up to this, that wouldn't be the same. So, you know, no nation's perfect. Could anybody could have done things differently? Um, you know, but what? What do they want Russia to have done? The Minsk agreements. What more could Russia have done than beg, beg, beg the United States to put pressure on Ukraine? Beg the French, beg the Germany, Normandy format to put pressure on the Ukrainians to just implement the accord. Implement the accord. Please implement the accord. That's all we want for you to implement the accord. Don't go into NATO. Don't go into NATO, Ukraine. No, NATO, stop expanding. We'll let them join the European Union. We'll let them do whatever they want. Just no, NATO, you can't come to my border. You can't do it. What more could Russia have done? They made this point clear. They put a draft treaty on the table in December that could have stopped this whole conflict. Now we have people, now we have the Democrats. Oh, uh, and when we sit down, we need a diplomatic off ramp that uh, that discusses at least uh, Russia's um, uh, legitimate concerns and the concept of a new European security framework. Who invented that concept? Russia. Now the people are starting to wake up to it, but at what cost? At what co- Ukraine is destroyed as a nation. Even if the war stopped today, Ukraine is not coming back. Physically, they've lost 20% of their territory. They'll never get it back. I don't know what kind of drugs the Zunzi's doing, but um, and give me some because I think it makes you feel pretty good. And you can imagine wonderful scenarios. Uh, but to think that Ukraine is going to get that territory back is wrong. Uh, and if you think, as Jan Stoltenberg has said, that uh, the only solution to this conflict is military, then Russia will win. NATO cannot beat Russia. Ukraine cannot beat Russia. There's no scenario you can come up with that Russia loses. You can make the cost of a Russian victory high. And I think that's the strategy right now, is to bring pain to Russia. But what part of Russia's history do you not understand when you know that when it comes to the existential survival of Russia, Russia will take all the pain you can give them and still emerge victorious, 27 million dead, 27 million dead. They've never forgotten that much. They've never forgotten that. In the West, we pretend it didn't happen. Indeed, and do, so do you see that uh, in the short, medium term, this conflict will end? Do you believe it? I believe that Russia will win this conflict militarily by, by next summer. I think the 200,000 troops that are about to arrive on the battlefield in a month's time uh, will fundamentally alter this. I don't think Ukraine and NATO will be able to assemble a sufficient military force to prevent the Russians from fully liberating the Novaya Rossiya, the new Russian territories, and possibly expanding into Odessa and Kharkov. I don't believe, uh, and I, I think the harder part will be the final political settlement. Uh, what, what will happen with that? I don't. Yeah, that's, and, that do you, and do you believe that uh, during the winter season that the hostilities at least uh, will calm down, or uh, the Russians will keep their active, their operations on the ground? Russia has never paused for the winter ever in its entire history. Russia started the special military operation in the dead of winter. Um, you know, the winter is not unfamiliar to Russia. Um, the military knows how to operate in the winter. There will be no operational pause. When the 200,000 troops arrive, Russia will immediately exploit the advantages that this surge of military capacity gives them. Um, take a look at what's happening today. Ukraine is being bombarded. Um, this will happen throughout the winter. There will not be 
peace in Ukraine. Anybody who thinks that there's going to be this moment in the winter where Ukraine can calm down and regroup, it isn't going to happen. Russia is in the business of destroying Ukraine right now, of destroying the Ukrainian military and destroying the political will of Ukraine to continue to fight by shutting the economy of Ukraine down. The West says they want to make this so painful to the Russians that they stop. Russia is making this painful to the West. The West is feeling the pain, not Russia. The West is suffering, not Russia. Ukraine is suffering, not Russia. The pain game is being won by Russia. So uh, last week, actually, I, I heard the former director of uh, Roscosmos saying that the most sophistic sophisticated weapons that Russia has uh, will arrive uh, in the Donbass in the forthcoming months. Uh, do you, uh, many people, I, I believe, I think that here in the West, many people think that the Russians have no more military means. I usually disagree with that because I often say that the Russians use the kind of, or the type of weapons that is needed for a, a certain time. But if they need to escalate and to use more sophisticated weapons, they will actually use them. Do you think that the, the, the Russians have this huge capability but their generals, their higher ranks, uh, are they good enough in order to uh, lead this uh, the, the fighting for the forthcoming months? Uh, now you're hitting on something. Now, now, now you're hitting on something. First of all, Russia has the technical means. Their equipment is some of the best in the world, and they're about to bring some equipment that hasn't been brought on this battlefield. And the soldiers know how to use this equipment. Question now is the military leadership. Um, Russia has, I think the, the, the partial mobilization pointed out some of the ugly realities of, of the Russian military system and, and, and Russian, uh, Russian society, that uh, the, the corruption of the 1990s still exists today, uh, that the um, level of independence enjoyed by the various um, governors in, in handling issues like national defense at their level you know, they're supposed to have 500,000 sets of equipment, uh, but they've been, you know, corrupt people have been selling them on the black market so that when the reservists show up, there's not enough equipment there. Well, how the hell is that? Heck, does that happen? That's bad. Um, I also think you're seeing that um, the, the, the political games have been playing in the Russian military haven't been just about achieving, you know, military competency, but achieving political viability that the military... Uh, is, is functioning within a Russian system uh, that requires money and the influence of money brings to elevate someone's political uh, fortune. And so there are groups of influence inside Russia that have allowed people to be promoted for the wrong reasons. And so you have people in decision-making uh, centers right now who are being called upon to do the military problem, but they weren't promoted because they're militarily proficient. They were promoted because they were the friends of somebody, because they were good at siphoning off resources, et cetera. And um, here's the question now. Um, is Russia able to overcome this deficit, this leadership deficit that they have? Russia has some very fine junior officers, some of the finest in the world. They have very fine um, medium, mid-level officers. But when you get up into the senior ranks, um, you know, the, these are people who have not been focused on fighting wars. And uh, are, they, are they proficient in the military art? Uh, and, and, you know, do they have the, the command presence necessary? And the answer on many occasions is no. Now, we have a commander right now, General uh, Surveikin, who is, the answer on that one is yes. Um, but now he has to go down and start cleaning the ranks. Um, and what happens when you run into the brigade commander who was given that brigade because he's friends of somebody close to the minister of defense? Do you get to fire this guy or do you have to keep him in place knowing that he's going to commit his brigade in an incompetent fashion, resulting in hundreds of casualties and the failure to accomplish the mission? Is, is that how you want to wage this uh, upcoming battle? This is Russia's Achilles heel. This is where Russia has a fundamental weakness. The good news is that it appears Russia is awakening to this reality and the consequences of allowing this to continue will be 
could be disastrous on the battlefield. These 200,000 troops, the quickest way to lose this war is to employ them ineffectively, to employ them piecemeal, to employ them in a manner that doesn't live up to the potential they bring. Um, and right now, I would say that there are military leaders who are fully capable of employing them improperly. They need to be removed. They need to be replaced. The purging of the ranks needs to occur. Um, and that is a political problem, not a military problem, but it has military consequences. So in the end of this conflict, what world order do you think will arise? I don't believe Russia is, uh, and we're going to have to unfortunately wrap it up soon because uh, my wife is uh, demanding my presence uh, oh, for thank lunch. You, thank you, thank uh, but, uh, you. <laughs> but uh, the, um, the, you know, Russia is not the United States, and, and this is an important fact. Russia is not looking to supplant NATO, the United States, or anybody in Europe. Russia is not looking to be the dominant power in Europe. What Russia wants is a new European security framework that respects Russia's legitimate national security um, demands, needs, wants, desires. Um, this is why I think Russia has to excise the Ukrainian cancer. And it's gonna be, you know, that's the key right there. Because if it's like with any surgery, if you do the surgery properly, you remove the cancer out without destroying the body. But if you don't remove enough of the cancer, the cancer can spread and kill the body. If you remove part of the body with the cancer that should have been removed, the body's weak. I mean, and, and, and so this is a huge political problem for Russia. How do you ensure that the military victory that you want to accomplish is done in parallel with the political reality you, you need to emerge from this. If you go in too hard with the military, it's going to be very difficult to get Europe and NATO to sit down at the table to talk about a new European security framework. Uh, if you go in too soft, the, the Europeans and NATO will think they won and they won't sit down at the table. You have to find that balancing act where you've accomplished what you wanted in a manner which allows Europe to sit back and reflect on cause and effect. Do we continue to confront Russia at what cost? Uh, do we have any chance of success? Or can we sit down with Russia and work with Russia as equals to, div you know, to not divvy up Europe, but to create a new European security framework? And this, this is what I think Russia is trying to do. This is why it's so important that they have somebody like Sergei, Sergei Lavrov, um, because this is a political problem. This is a diplomatic problem. And you need a grand master doing this. And in Sergei Lavrov, they have a grand master. This is why you need a, 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 a Nikolai Petrushev, um, you know, on the other side, too. I mean, Russia has the right people in the right place at that upper political level where they can manage what I call the soft landing of the United States and Europe um, so that when the military um, campaign is finished, there's a potential for this new European security framework. Um, but it's, it, there's no guaranteed outcome here, no guaranteed outcome. It's a very delicate uh, proposition. Russia, even though they shouldn't lose this war, Russia can still lose this war. Um, and they can lose it militarily and they can lose it politically. So it's, you know, Russia has a very uh, difficult task ahead of it. Fortunately, I believe they have the political leadership necessary to the task. And I think they understand what's required to um, make sure the military can accomplish its mission. The, the military one's the tougher thing. They have the right tools, but they don't have the right craftsmen. And they're going to have to make some changes at the craftsman level so that the tools get used properly so that they accomplish the mission. Uh, Mr. Readers, first, let me once again thank you for joining us and for being here with us, sharing all your knowledge and your insight on this present situation. I just want to ask you if you have any kind of advice for our audience, uh, any other, any special words that you want to, to provide to our audience that sit here with us, just to hear into you and uh, all your knowledge. Well, I mean, you know, I. I I've sort of hijacked the, the term uh, knowledge is power. I, I put out these little two minute videos and I use knowledge is power, but it's the truth. Um, knowledge is power and the empowerment of an individual by the accumulation of knowledge is the only path to victory uh, when, when truth is at, at stake. When, the, when, when this is a battle about facts, a battle about truth, you have to learn, you have to empower yourself with knowledge so that you can overcome all of the obstacles 
principles, all the disinformation, all the propaganda that's out there. Uh, you know, ignorance comes from fear. You, 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 you fear that which you don't know. And the only way to overcome this fear, this ignorance-based fear, is through knowledge, the empowerment. So now we just had this long conversation. My advice to everybody listening to this is the following. You just listened to 90 minutes of conversation with the best Russian propagandist the world has ever seen. I am everything the Ukrainians have accused me of. I twist facts, I do this, I distort, I do everything. Don't take anything I said at face value. Challenge everything. Assume that I'm lying. Go forth and take everything I've said and subject it to research, subject it to independent analysis. And if at the end of it you say, I agree with Scott Ritter, good, because that means that there's a foundation to your agreement. You have empowered yourself with knowledge. But if you simply leave this podcast and say, I agree with everything Scott Ritter said without first checking it, you've made a mistake. You've made a fundamental mistake. You've assumed that I'm correct. You've assumed that my heart's in the right place. Don't assume anything. Do the work. Do the work. It's hard work, but it's necessary work. If you're an American, I say this kind of work is absolutely essential to make you the kind of informed citizen that our country needs when we talk about selecting people to represent us in higher office and holding them accountable. We need to be an informed citizen. If you're a global citizen, it's the same thing that you need to do to hold your respective governments accountable for what they do in your name. But if you simply leave and say, Scott Ritter's right, he's a heck of a guy, I'm glad I watched this, that's no good. Because now when somebody hits you with something, all you're going to be able to say is, well, Scott Ritter disagrees. It ain't good enough. You need to be able to say, I disagree because of the following. All that. So I think this was valuable. Thank you for having me on and having the opportunity to talk to people. But I always get a little nervous when I get put on a pedestal. People say, oh, Scott Ritter said, guys, don't do that game. I don't want to be on that pedestal. I want to be down here with you in the trenches fighting the information fight challenging everything that's said, learning facts and information. Um, and then we can move to accomplish the mission together. But if you put me up here and you say, that's, that's what it is, you're weakening yourselves. You need to get up there with me. Thank you for, uh, very much for those wise words. Please apologize to your wife on my behalf. I'm really yeah. sorry for taking so much time, but uh, the conversation was uh, so good, uh, such a high quality that uh, I still didn't notice the time passing. But once again, Mr. Scott Ritter, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, I wish that you have uh, all the success possible uh, and that you continue with your mission, because the, I think that telling the truth is a mission and clarifying people is a mission. Even though it is not paid, it isn't paid job, let me talk like that, but at least is a very noble mission. Thank you once again for being with us. Thank, uh, well, be welcome to, to Portugal anytime you want to, to come to our country. And anything you need, please uh, be my guest. I'll be here uh, waiting for you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And um, if you ever thought this kind of conversation was would be useful in the future, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you very much. Have a great okay. day, Mr. Green.